So, day 39, finishing up. The plan this week is uh, to finish up today and Wednesday uh, the various databases of this last section. And then uh, Friday to do a review preparing you for the what's going to be on the final, which will be a project on all four sections in Office. A bigger project in PowerPoint and, or sorry, in Excel and Access, some small projects in Word and PowerPoint. So this Bible database, we started, but let's grab that assignment over here. I'll open the assignment and have those instructions right there on the page as we look at them as we have our database open and see how we get these various queries. So let's just review quick the database parts <clears throat> as I think I have it open somewhere here. Oh, I thought I did. Let's grab access. And there's my man Bible. And just remember, the structure of the database determines how we run our queries, how we connect them, how we join these first two tables. <clears throat> and if I right-click design of that, I see that bib ID is the number of the book. I'm just going to put a little comment in there. I'm going to close the properties here. I'm just going to put a little comment. Matches book number in Bible master table no no that's not right that's not right the book num matches uh, the Bible master let me look at that one the Bible master has mass ID that's right so back to design of the this one this one matches mass ID in the Bible master table had it backwards nice thing about these little comments is someone else looking at this wondering what in the world this is all about it's a little helpful for them so that's the thing to remember and remember when I look at the data that I see that's just a number for the record, chapter, verse, verse number, or the narration of the verse. The book num, if I book, look back at Bible Master, I see book num goes with one for Genesis, two for Exodus. And the other field we want to worry about is OTNT is an O if it's Old Testament, it's an N if it's New Testament. And the real name is the more familiar name of the book. This mass book is a shortened version of the book name. So knowing the structure, the design, the relationships between those two tables, now we can proceed and know how to do these queries. And I see that I have queries A through F, and we just have a few more to do. Let's just help Anthony out here. Let's let's help you first on this. Uh, we'll do Psalm 23 for you, Anthony. Going to start a new query. We want both the name of the book and the text in it. So I'm going to double click that table, double click Bible Master. And remember, book num matches mass ID. So I drag book num to mass ID. And that's telling the query. When I'm looking for the name of the book, MAS real name, it's the one that has the matching book number in this table. So I'm going to do name of the book, chapter, verse, and the context or the text of the verse. That will give me the entire Bible if I don't have any criteria. All 31,103 verses. But to add to get Psalm 23, I put Psalms for the book name in the criteria. Get it spelled right or it won't come out. And I get the chapter 23. 
And the verses, I don't need to do this, but it doesn't hurt to just tell it sort ascending on verses. And there I have Psalm 23. So just to review, book, no, book name, chapter, verse, narration, and then those criteria. Oh, for some reason it got way down here on a criteria. Any of these lines after the criteria are valid criteria. Lines. Okay, so now to G. All chapter 3, verse 16 verses sorted alphabetically. Well, it's the same fields. I want to see the book name, chapter, verse, and what's in the verse. The criteria in this case is all chapter 3, verse 16. So for the chapter, I put 3. And for the verse, I put 16. But I want them sorted alphabetically, so uh, I'm not going to sort on the verse number, so I change that to not sorted. And narration, I'm going to sort alphabetically by narration. I suppose it's conceivable someone might confuse alphabetically meaning sorting by the book name, but what I meant was a sorting alphabetically by the actual narration. Now, let's see what we get when we look at just the chapter 3, verse 16 verses. And I have them sorted alphabetically by verse. And I can go through your entire Bible. I should have 66. Oh, I only have 49. Oh, that's right. Some books don't have a chapter 3. So I get 49 uh, results. And I could do a study of all the chapter 3, verse 16 verses and come up perhaps with some interesting theology only studying that particular verse, making some connections between them. And would you believe, I did have a friend once that thought this was a great way to study the Bible. Pick, pick verse 3 and, and, or pick verse 16 of chapter 3's. You may find some interesting thoughts, but remember the verse numbers are not necessarily inspired. They're put there just to help track the verses and reference them. So don't, don't think naming <laughs> Simon Peter had anything to do with Moses numbering according to the word of Jehovah. But it makes it just fun little query. So again looking at the design making sure I got it right. Yep, chapter 3 verse 16. And saving you then. You did a sending and narration, right? Yeah, sending and narration because of the of the last phrase sorted alphabetically just to add some interesting uh, aspect to my query. Okay, so that one's done. I can, since I haven't saved it yet, I can control S, save it as G, chapter 3, verse And remember the, the the only real you know tricky thing about it this is making sure you're doing that join on book number to mass ID, otherwise you'll get some huge list. For every book you'll have all its verses, and your query will be huge. Your query results. All verses containing the word God or Lord or Almighty. Well, remember how we did the last time, but here's, how, here's the way I like to uh, create a new query. If it's similar to one I just did, and I accidentally renamed that 6 instead of G, I'm going to rename that and fix that. It's G, not 6. I right, change that to a G. I'm going to copy, paste it, Control C, Control V, and then give it the name H. And the H is containing God or Lord or Almighty. And then go to deadline it. So and take away the 3 and the 16. And I didn't say to sort them alphabetically, so I'll take away the ascending by changing it to not sorted. 
And then the narration is, well, what should the narration be if it contains God or Lord or Almighty? Just write all three down the row. And what do I write? God is one, then Lord and Almighty. God, Lord, Almighty. You sure about that? You got the or part right. So what's missing? Uh, the star. Yeah, that's right. The star around it because it could have something before it, the asterisk, or something after it. So can, remember, containing means star, whatever word we're looking for, and then a star after it. If I don't put a star after it, it means the verse has to end with Lord. If I don't put a star before it, the verse has to start with Lord, or with that word. And it adds like to it. So if it started with Almighty and ended with Lord, there, well, oh, it's or, or contains God. See how this one is, you can see that I have contains God, ends with Lord, or starts with Almighty. And since they're on separate lines, they're ors. So I did get results because it contained God. And see, now it contains any of those words by having star in front and after. And the results should be, I'm guessing, a large number of verses. Let's see how many get. 4,946 verses. Right. And with this querying of this particular version of the Bible, you have more power at your fingertips in access than you do with many Bible programs that have very limited search capabilities. When they say search a word, it's, it contains that word. I'm not sure. Some of them don't even let you, you know, look for a particular phrase. It's every time you look for a word, it contains that. I could actually put specific phrases in here. Uh, starts with a particular word. Even forms of words. You could be, create much more complex queries than any Bible search program. Question? Um, I only got two results. So under narration, you have star, God, star, star, Lord, star, and oh, Almighty, make sure Almighty ends with a star as well. Oh. There you go. But still, you should have got one, too. Oh, star got, make sure there's a star at the end of every one. Oh, it's outside, or inside the quote is the star. Oh. It makes you, it's going to make you pick all my choice. You're going to put it inside. There we go, right? That's what it says. And same with the word of God. So whenever you see the question contains that text, be sure to put asterisks on both sides. Okay, so that one, I've already given the name. Oh, no, I didn't give it the right name. I, I'm meditating the wrong one, so I, I almost did a control S and wiped out my G query. So I'm going to close this without saving changes and go fix my H query. That's what it was supposed to be. I was editing the wrong one for a second there. So star, God, star, star, Lord, star, and star almighty. I almost messed up the, my previous query. 4,946. And this time I'll do a control S. Now, to our very last one, I'm going to copy, control C, control V, give it the name G, phrase, Christ, well, both Christ and Lord in the verse. And I, not G, for the query name. Now I'm going to edit it. So, all verses containing the words Christ and Lord. So how am I going to do that? Take away what I had there before. 
Do I put, how, how do I get it containing both Christ and Lord? There's a couple ways I could do this. You could put, you could have three lines in there. Actually, uh, well, you could yeah, I think that would. Narration, and then you can uncheck mark one of them. Yeah. And yeah. then just put on the same line, put Christ, Christ on one and Lord on the other. Right. With the star. So here's one way to do it. I could have an aeration in there twice, but only show one of them by unchecking the show box. But in the criteria, criteria I'd have star, Christ, star, and on the other one, have star, Lord, star. Okay, this is one way to do it. Having, there, having the same field in there twice, so I could have them on the same line. Let's see what I get for results. I get 102 results. Another way I could do it, and you'll see which one is, well, this one, it looks maybe a little simpler. I could put like Christ and like, quote, star, Lord, star. I could actually use the word and, and like, and then the word star, Lord, star in quotes that would also give me those results. So you can do the same field twice, showing one and not the other, just so you don't have narration showing up in two columns. And then add this to it. You can put ands in there. And some Bible search programs do let you add the ands in there yourself. It's fairly common. Most of them don't have you put the like in there. That The like is a access puts, it in, puts that in there in this search. And let's see if this gives me the same 102 results. Yeah, I get the same result. So if you actually look, <clears throat> if you remember how you can look at the actual SQL code it generates, I believe the SQL code looks very similar, but you don't have to. And that's something that you can look at if there's, there's a real technical <coughs> issue with the actual query. All we care about is the results view, the data sheet view, or the design view. So that may be a little easier to remember. But either one will give you the same results. All right. Just for fun here, let's see. We've got our queries here. How about we come up with some of our own just for practice? Thinking maybe what kind of thing would Mr. Manning pick to do a question on something like a final. What kind of query would would you have to do? We've done ands of multiple criteria. We've done verse numbers. Any particular verses that come to mind? Let's say I'm reading the Bible. Say I start at the beginning and the verse begins with the, with the word in. Hmm. Are there other verses in the Bible that begin with the word in? What would I put for criteria? Star in star. Star in star? To begin with the word in? Oh, to begin with the word, you put the star at the beginning? Or the star at the end? Well, remember, star stands for anything can be here, where the star is. So if I do in star, that means I have the word in and then anything coming to the right of it. So in star would be verses that begin with the word in or, now look, look at this, what I get, let's see what I get. I don't know why it's complaining there. It used to put the like, oh, maybe because I don't have a star before it, I have to do the quotes around it. Didn't realize that before. I get 331 results. Let's see if they all begin with the word in. I'm thinking I could use, they might begin with indeed, incline. Uh oh. So it's not all just the word in, in so much. There's a few there. How would I fix that to just start with the word in and not incline or indeed? 
or in so much. What, what would I do to fix that? Only the word in by itself. Any ideas? It only begins with the word in, not in so much or incline. Another incline instead. There's not many that don't have the word in, but there's a few more. Or remember, remember we, in when we when I have the word in, what comes between it and another word? A space. So I could say in space star, and that would mean it would be the word in. Nothing and a, and a space after in, and then anything else. Now. I get a smaller, slightly smaller result, 312, that have the word in, I, or the letters I-N, and then a space. Now I have the, the verses that only begin with the word in. Sure. So if I'm looking for begins within, In the narration, it would be in, or I'll put the whole thing that access does. I'll do like, quote, in, and then a space, and then a star. Without the space, it could be the word instead, or the word in so much. But this means a space has to come. That means there's just the word in, and then star. And that would be under narration. And it shows like in space star. Uh oh, let's see what we get here. Let's look at the design. And we have like you have star in. There's no we don't put a star at the beginning. Because then remember the star, if you had a star before the word in, then it would be anything can you know in could be anywhere in the word, you're gonna get a huge amount because in is a very popular word. So no star here, but a space and then anything can come at, after that. So remember when you're looking for beginning with that word. Let's see, can you think of anything interesting? Any interesting quote, uh, quote uh, searches, queries? Uh, not. Oh, that does not include some kind of word. How about how, ver, how about verses that do not contain in? Just put not. Yeah, yeah, you can do a you could do not like star quote star in star. Just put a not in front of it, and it's does not contain the word in. And if I view it, I see that they're eight thousand seven hundred sixty-five. That do not contain the word in. Let's make a let's pick a more common word. Let's see if we can shorten those results down here. Let's pick a more common word. How about the? How about words verses that do not have the word the in them? I mean that's like about in every sentence. Let's see what we get. Verses that do not contain the word the. Three hundred three thousand six hundred eighty-one. And to narrow it down even Shorter, let's see, uh, how about verses that do not contain the word and either. So not the and not and. And I can do the, since I want them on the same line, I can add and not like star and star. So that does not contain the word the or and and keep shortening the words and how about not just to let the word a by itself so back to that design how about and not 
Well, we can't just do star A star, because that's going to remove every word that ever had an A in it anywhere. So I have to do star space A space star for the word A by itself somewhere in the middle of a sentence. Now let's see how many verses have that. Oh, we're shortening it down to 900 verses. And you can see how we could shorten our results down. Oh, I see they spelled Leviticus wrong in that mass ID. Okay, that's enough fun with this. Uh, see how you can get complex, but remember the criteria down here, you can use the word not and and before and in between. Or like we showed before, we could... place it on multiple columns. So here's here's a complicated one. I might perhaps I'll give you a query that's that you know did something like this and you'd say, well what is this looking for? Well it's looking for verses that contain the or have T this think about this. If I'm actually looking for the word the I might put a space before and after the the word. Because right now the way it is, T H E could be these, them it's also going to find that because there's no space. Same with this. This would also find verses that had thousand in it. Any any word that has an and somewhere in it would be found because there's no space before or after and. Here, it is looking for specifically the word because it has a space before and after the a. So to be to be exactly the word the. I'd have to, have to do something like this, the somewhere in a sentence in the middle, and and somewhere in a sentence in the middle, if I'm looking for just that specific word, and then the word a. So recognizing how queer, what queries are doing is a useful thing as well. The main thing I want you to get from here is in databases, queries are what pulls the information out of the database and unless you had it in a database format, these searches either are, are impossible or take very long. If you're doing it in a program like Excel, where you can, you can hold lots of data in Excel, but to actually search for things, it's not built to do searches like databases are. And that's why sites like Google have huge databases and very powerful database programs in them. So when you do a search, it finds your results in less than a second of huge and after searching through huge databases. Okay, so let's close that and we'll get on to the AC3 project which has to do with maintaining a database. Yep, once you're done with this. Uh, and you don't have to do our extra queries unless you, unless you would like to. Closing this, I'm not saving changes because that was just a little bit of experimenting. And closing that access database. Remember when the databases are closed, uh, then a little lock file won't show up. I should go check to make sure you haven't sent the lock file instead of the actual file. Okay, so on to our next assignment, which is AC3, which again is just a copy of AC2, and then we're going to Add, th add some things to it. So let me go down to the AC3 project showing up there and it's basically in the book so I'm going to first go to my uh, AC2 access file. I might as well just open up from access because access remembers where it is as a recent file. I can go open up my my AC2 and just do a file save as save database as and save that as AC3. With your last name in front of it. So I'm saving this as Manning AC3. Enabling content and then bringing up the book pages so I know what it wants me to do.
Okay, so we're done with that Bible. I didn't give you the mums. Oh, we did do the mums database. Now this one, it's all about maintaining a database. Uh, where you have, suppose you have a database uh, inventory of a store is a typical, very common database. Or, uh, or the orders, it, customer invoices. And uh, sometimes a database needs to be modified, changing its structure. Sometimes we need to back it up. And let's see what they want us to do with this one. Uh, change some data in it. We're going to come back and, uh, and modify the data. And in order to do that, they want us to first create this thing called a split form. Question? We start with AC2 and then save it as AC3. Because AC2, AC3 is AC2 with modifications. So open AC2 and then do a save as, save database as. Well, first thing they want us to do is just to show how we can create different forms in this database than we had before. And so we're going to create a different table, a different form using the customer table. So we're going to click on the customer table, create, and then go to more forms and create a split form. Remember, we can use the three, just about three click method on this. Choose the table we're going to create the form on, customer table. So there's one click. Click the create tab. And instead of the three standard forms, remember, remember when you want to just create a plain form, I can click that one. That'll start a form for me. If I want to design my own, I could start there. But underneath more forms, I'm going to just choose the split form. And the nice thing about the split form it it shows you as I go through the data up here in a nice user friendly form I can also see the data in the data sheet form and as I go through my records it shows me up here what's in there but down here the actual line in the table and because this is such a popular way for people to view data in a table they made the split form I can adjust how much of that's lower part I see. I can edit it down here as well as edit it up here. Now for some people this might be confusing. So use the split form only when the people that are using the database aren't confused by it. See how I click here? It shows me the data. Click here, it shows me that record, but when I click here, I'm actually see, oh, that's the box that goes with that column. I can edit it in either place. So customer table, split form, and I can save this. Customer table is the name it's going to give me because that was the actual uh, table name. I'm going to call it customer split form. If I close it and go back, expand my objects here, I can see in my form section down here, I have that customer split form. Wait, how do you do that? Like save as method? Yep. Well, it, since it was, when, once you do a save, if it's the first time you're saving it, it'll ask you the name of it. So I didn't even need to do a save as. If you already open another form, it should be, uh, it'll you can do a save as. Okay, so we've basically created just a different way of viewing the data. So we have added an additional form to an existing database. So that was nothing terribly earth-shaking, earth just creating another form on the database I have. And there's my result. I have a wonderful new form, and I've saved it. Now remember in the forms, we can browse the existing data as well as go add a new record. And so suppose that we have another customer to add to our record. Let's 
let's see if we have CRU Christie University in here. If I go back to my split form, or, or either form, if I go back to that, I don't have a Christie University, as far as I can tell. So to add a new, a new record, down here at the, the navigation field takes us way to the bottom to add a new record, the arrow to the right and a little yellow, like an asterisk, that takes me to a blank form. And then I can enter the information CRU11. Christie University thirty two hundred University Place and see as I go to different fields, it's filling them out. This guy right here takes me to the new blank record. Since you have blank boxes, I can tell you're there. And you can type up above or type down below on the blank. Pleasantburg, New Jersey. And 07025. Zero for amount paid. Oh, they owe me some money. Fourteen two fifty to open their account. They have not paid me anything. Fourteen two fifty for what they owe me, and they've not returned anything. And we're assigning them book rep number forty two. This is the dangerous one right now because I might accidentally enter a number here that does not match any other book rep number or an existing book rep number. So let me just type uh, 99 in there and it's not going to complain even though I know book rep number 99 does not exist. So we have a problem. We're not enforcing a thing called referential integrity in our database. Let me come back here and put in a valid Rep, book rep number. I know there is a 42. But we want to fix our database so we can't accidentally type a book rep number that does not exist. So I'm going to close this form and we're going to modify our database to make sure book rep numbers are only entered for existing book rep numbers. The way to do that is to go to database tools click the database tools tab and click relationships database tools relationships and I'm gonna put both tables in here book rep table double click customer table double click and close similar to our uh, design view of our queries and I'm enlarging these just so I can see all the fields and what we're gonna do here is tell access the relationship between book rep number here and book rep number here has special properties. So let's drag book rep number from one table to the other. That's telling it the relationship between these two tables, a customer book rep number, is related to book rep number in the book rep table. And here is the important thing, enforcing referential integrity. What that means is when I refer to a book rep number from the customer table, that has to be in the book rep table or Access won't even let it, uh, that number be entered in my customer record. So now when I create this, I should see a line up here now in the relationships. If I ever want to go back, I can just double click on the line. Make sure you have checked enforced referential integrity. Okay, let me go here again. Starting over, database tools, relationships, show both tables, 
and then drag book rep number from one table to the other to tell access they are these tables are related by book rep number and make sure you choose enforce referential integrity okay and then close it and it should show a line if it gives you an error message there may be a problem did you get an error message what's it say the database information lost tables yeah, so that's another thing. Make sure your tables are all closed before you come to relationships. So close this not and save changes and close your tables. There you go. That's another thing. Access, especially when you're doing this, access complaints. That table's open. I can't change this. Now see if it'll let you do that. There you go. And make sure check, check uh, enforce referential integrity. You sure you have it closed? You have to have all the other forms closed. Because it's because that form is related to the table. Ah, so when you created your customer or book rep table, you did not make it the correct data type. Anyone get another the error with the data type? All right, we'll come back and fix that. Saving the changes now. Now watch what happens. Oh, drag to the wrong one. <clears throat> now that that database relationship is in there, looking at our book reps, I know my only valid book reps are these four, 65, 53, 48, and 42. Watch what happens when I try to enter a different book rep, an invalid book rep now. Say I'm going to change that last, that Christy that I just entered. Let's change that book rep to a non-existent one. Let's change it to 99. Uh-oh, you cannot add or change a record because a related record is required in the book table, book rep table. Uh, not a very friendly message, but it gives me a clue that that record is not in the book rep table. So this relationships, uh, enforcing this relationship keeps my data from being corrupted and having a bad reference to a book rep number. So I'm so I bet I can do a control Z undo, go back to what was there before, and then it will be happy. So enforcing referential integrity, very important thing I can do in my design of my database. Making sure my data does not allow invalid numbers to be entered in certain very important places, like the book rep number for a customer. So it's another thing we do with databases is uh, design the, the structure of them so they contain good data because we're the tables and the integrity of the data is very important. When I'm in a form, I can search for things using Control F. I think we covered that in the very first part. I can just edit records just by clicking on certain parts of them. I'm going to skip some of the filtering. That's similar to queries, basically, in the editing. Filtering by form, filtering, sorting. Again, it's very much similar to uh, just queries. Very common thing, though, that the database has most everything we need, but we need a little extra information. Suppose I need to add a new field to a table, such as customer type. I want to go back to my customer table and add a field called customer type and I want to create I want it to be something that they can select from a list of types of customers. So here's how we do that. We close all our tables and queries and then go to design view of the customer table. Design view of customer table. And let's see where we're putting this. We're putting customer type right after postal code. Okay, so we want to insert a new type of a field, a new field right below postal code. So I go to amount paid and right click insert rows because it always inserts a row above where I ask it and I put customer type in here for the name. Customer type. 
And because I wanted to have a list of things to select from, again, helping to keep my data uh, integrity, I'm going to, instead of short text the default, I'm going to jump all the way to the bottom and use the lookup wizard for the selection of customer type. And I'm going to type in the values that are allowed in customer type. And then I click Next. And now, in a little mini table that pops up, I'm going to enter the various valid customer types, which are given to us in the book here. Three types, HS, COM, or UNI. HS, oops, HS, COM, or UNI. And this, you can see it's kind of creating like a mini table here of the valid values that a customer can be. And are we limiting to lists? Uh, that's a very important thing. Do we only let them choose what's in the list? Oh, we're not checking limit to list. All right. And we click finish. Now, let's see how that works before we're done here. This is our last thing today. I go back to data sheet view, saving my changes. I've added a, a field to this table. Now I see a new column called customer type. And I can now see how that works. It shows up as a select box. And I can choose the type of customer from a, a list of valid customer types. So making it a lookup makes it a little uh, easier for someone to know, well, what should, I, what should be typed here? Well, you have the selection. And that's why, and this, this typically they limit you to this selection, especially when you're choosing a, the state you're in when you're entering data on a form. This makes sure you don't actually type an invalid state. As annoying as it is, having to select from the 50 states, finding Iowa in there, this just guarantees somebody doesn't spell their state incorrectly when they're entering data on a form. And that's why you come across this all over the place when you're registering on databases or putting in your information. They're guaranteeing the information gets in the database correctly. We'll stop there today. We'll finish this up on Wednesday and go on to reviewing database coming towards the end here. So saving that. Uh, don't submit it yet because we're not quite done. Have a great day.